Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in to this Enabling Change Innovation webinar. Today's webinar is looking at a range of free products from Google that can help us enable change. No doubt you're already familiar with Google Search and how it is powerful yet easy to use. Today we'll explore some, some more of Google's offerings, including Google Drive and Google+. Now to help us with that, we're privileged to have Prue Cook joining us today from Horsham in Victoria. Prue works for the Department of Environment and Primary Industries in Victoria as a Grains Extension Officer, specialising in the use of digital technologies for productivity purposes. In fact, it was when Prue was up here in Queensland earlier this year running a workshop that I approached her about running today's webinar. And when she isn't busy running workshops and webinar, webinars like this, Prue lives in the Victorian Wimmera, close to her family's sheep and grain property. So Prue, it's lovely to have you along with us today. Up here in Toowoomba, the weather is a bit cold, it's about 20 degrees, but it's a lovely sunny day. What's it like in Horsham for you today? It's, it's a wee bit chilly up here. <laughs> yes, okay, I can only imagine. Okay, so Prue, we can hear you and we can see the slides, so um, please share some of your experience with us. Excellent. Thank you, John, and it's lovely to be here today. Um, today I'm going to talk through a number of free Google products in my day-to-day -day work to streamline existing processes, enhance collaboration, and increase my exposure to information that's relevant to my work. So I'm going to try and help you to do the same and get you thinking about how that might apply to your individual work situation. As you'll see on the next slide, uh, we're going to start by talking about Google Drive, which is a cloud-based file storage system. So we're going to outline some of the positive and negatives to help you assess if it might be useful in your work. We'll give a demonstration and we'll talk about how it compares with some other popular cloud storage products. We're also going to let you try using Google Drive, should you wish, so that we can all collaborate on a set of group notes that's relevant to this webinar. We'll then move on to Google+, which is Google's attempt at a social media platform. I'll demonstrate some of the applications. We can again discuss positives and negatives because there are good things and bad things about all the technologies that we'll discuss today. So we'll be completely honest about what those are so that you can assess it against your own needs. Um, and then we'll have a look at how it compares with other social media platforms and why you might choose to use uh, Google Plus instead of or as a complement to other social channels. And finally, we'll finish up with a quick overview of a number of other free Google products. We're not going to have time to cover all products as there's a lot out there, so I've chosen a handful that I use regularly that might be or might not be particularly well known, and I'd encourage anyone using other Google to tools to contribute their experiences to the group notes that I'll share in a bit. Um, before we get started on Google Drive, though, in order to access all the products we'll be demonstrating today, you'll need a Google account. If you use Gmail, then this account is exactly the same. A Google account will give you access, as you can see on the screen there, to Gmail, G+, YouTube, Google Play. So if you're an Android user, you'll already have an account and the full suite of Google products. I find this quite handy in terms of password management because there's only one username and password to remember. But you, because it is overseeing a number of different accounts, make sure that that's a very strong password. Also, all the products that we're demonstrating today will be available on mobile devices as well as at your desktop computer. So there's respective apps for your smartphone and or tablet that will allow you to continue doing what you do at your desk while you're out and about. All right, so I'll get um, John to pass privileges over to me to present and we're going to jump straight into Google Drive. Okay. So this is Google Drive here. As you can see, it's just a fairly standard file storage system where you can create folders and add a lot of different file types, just as you would with conventional computing. I have all my folders down here to the left and to the right, if I hit, and I've just got to hide that little bar there, if I hit this little information bar up here, that will show me any activity that's happened recently. So. Um, this is really fantastic. If you've asked a number of different people to review a document, for example, you can quickly see who has updated the document and when. 
Up the top is a search bar here, which gives you the ability to easily find documents that you've previously uploaded. Or you can search via type over here. To upload a file, you can either hit the upload button here, which gives you the ability to browse for files or folders on your computer, or a little bit easier, and I'm just going to quickly minimise my screen, um, is, oh, no, nope, because I've just shared the clean version, but what you can actually do, so I can't demonstrate that right now because of the sharing on the webinar, but you could actually just drag and drop a file from your desktop, which is very, very quick and simple to get those documents in there. And if you work on two screens, it's really, really handy. You can just select a number of different documents, drag them across, drop them into the drive, and they will upload straight away. Another great feature if you're a Gmail user is the option to add attachments to Drive from within your email. So this is my Gmail account here. I sent myself a test document earlier. All I would need to do is hover over the attachment, click Save to Drive, and it, um, then I can choose the appropriate folder, and it should appear in my Drive relatively quickly once that's uploaded. If you wanted to create a new item, you can hit the Create in the top left-hand corner. This gives you the ability to create a document, a spreadsheet, presentation, a picture, or a folder, which is very similar to all Microsoft Office pro uh, products. You'll also see the option for form here. This is equivalent to a SurveyMonkey type tool. I've used Google Forms a few times, but I do keep reverting to SurveyMonkey as I personally find that it gives me a few more options in terms of the types of responses that I can gather. But that said, it is a continuously improving product. And so if cost is an issue, um, you might want to use um, this one as it doesn't have a free versus paid model like SurveyMonkey, which means you can ask more than 10 questions and customise your survey a bit more without having to pay. You also see that I have here on the right-hand side a couple of other create options. These are apps that I've added myself, so some mind mapping, chart developing type tools. So if you hit the Connect More Apps button at the bottom, it'll bring up a list of possible apps that you may wish to use. And you can pinpoint your search by choosing a particular area. So for the purposes of today's exercise, we'll hit Productivity. And you'll find some apps that will create files that meet your particular work requirements. So as you can see here, if we go through, there's some that will work with PDFs. There's Fusion Tables, which work with big data. Um, there's Google Forms there. There's a floor planner. So if you're in the architect or just do, uh, doing a bit of a renovation, that's there. Some more mind mapping, some photo type stuff, some notes, document signing, which could be quite useful. So as you can see, there's a lot of different options that you could choose there. So if you know that there's a particular type of document that you need to create fairly regularly within your work, then there might be an appropriate app that will help you meet that. So you can just choose. Most of those are free, and you would just hit them and hit Connect to add that as an option in your Create bar. We'll exit out of that now. Um, I'm just going to show you, though, one that I do really like an app that I've added is um, from the template gallery. And so this is a, collect, a collaborative resource of various templates that you might like to use. So anything from meeting agendas, invoice templates, budget calculators and calendars can be searched and accessed for through here. So you could either search up in the top here or you could view by category down here. Um, so instead of creating something from scratch, you can take one of these templates and doctor it to fit your requirements. All the templates are submitted by various Google users, so if you're the generous type, you might want to submit one of your own. Right. We're going to go into the group notes that I've been working on now, which is this document here. I've created a document which has some details about the things that we're going to be discussing today. I've created some tables, I've left some blank spaces and started creating, uh, taking a few notes, but I thought this would be a good opportunity to get some collaborative learning going and getting everyone adding their thoughts and experiences with some of these products. I'm also very interested in learning some things that I might not know about these two because if I tried to be across every single Google product that there was, I wouldn't have time to do all my other work. 
Uh, so what I've done with this document is I've hit this share function up here that's up in the right hand corner. And what I've done here is that anyone with the link can edit. Normally, if you're just wanting to share a document with colleagues, you would just choose for a specific people. But this is a public document today that everybody on this webinar can work with. So um, we will just leave it as this option now, leave that as is. Um, so I've got this link here. And I'm going to share that with John, and John will share that with you. And if you cut and paste that into your browser, you should then be able to access that document. Um, while everyone's doing that, I'll just mention that this document will be available following the webinar, so you can access it in the future should you wish. But I will ask that during the webinar, if you could uh, please refer questions to John through the webinar chat bar, because if I'm looking at questions and trying to present at the same time, I might spontaneously combust or something to that effect. Um, while we're in the share option here, and while you're getting on, I'll show you what you would most of the time be the option you would select. So you'd make sure that um, everybody, or you, that only specific people could access that document. And then you can invite people. So you can see that I've added John to this option here. I have the ability to change what he does. So he, might, he can edit this one, but I might want him to just have the ability to write comments, but not actually edit the document. Or I might just want him the ability, uh, give him the ability to view that document. Um, so you can change it there. So that'd be really handy. Um, I was talking about my, uh, this to my brother who farms with my father the other day, and he was saying this would be great because I want Dad to be able to see our record spreadsheets, but not necessarily touch the spreadsheets because he might uh, you know, press something that's a bit wrong. So that's a good feature there. To invite someone, all you'd need to do is type in their email address, um, give them the ability to do what you would like with it, and then you could add a message if you wanted. And then you can send that off to them. And they will receive an email with a link that guides them through into that particular document. We'll cancel out of that for now. OK. I can see that we've got quite a number of people on the document, so this is great. Just to mention, if you have invited specific individuals, what you could see up in the top here um, is the actual users. Uh, so you'd see usually see their picture and their name, so that would be very easy. Um, but here, for today's purposes, you're all given an anonymous um, animal or vegetable, so you're all anonymous for now. Once you're in a file, it runs fairly similar to Microsoft Office project, uh, product, sorry, except that we can all collaborate at the same time. As you can see that many people are doing now, there's anonymous buffaloes and gophers and everybody's having fun. This is wonderful. Please feel free to edit and uh, add, in, add in whatever you see fit. Um, so you've got the ability up here that you can insert. I like that you can um, insert an image and just go straight from Google search. So you can search for an image and that can drop that in straight away. There's a few bits and pieces that are quite fun. I like the comment section as well too. So what you can do is write a comment, which is that little button up there. You could write your comment, and then other people can comment on your comment. So someone can come back in, write an answer. So the changes made in that document will come up in the color next to their name. So uh, John and I made some changes last week. So if I click on that, you can see that John, because he's got that light blue, he was anonymous at the time there, he's added this section here. So this is fantastic. Um, and if you would like to go back to that revision because some changes have been made and you don't think they reflect where you want to go, you hit this, restore this revision and it will re revert back to that original form. Um, I mentioned before that you can get apps that create particular types of files within Google Drive, or you can also get apps that work within the Google Drive for files, and these are called add-ons, which you can access from here. Um, I do a fair bit of work with social media and evaluating social media. So you can see here I use a couple of add-ons that allow me to include social media metrics into documents or allow me to search for tweets and add them into documents without having to exit this one tab. Um, but we'll have a look at what some of the other add-ons are. So if you go to Get Add-ons, 
once again, you've got a big list here. So you could see here's an easy bibliography curator, which would be fantastic. Translate, there's a thesaurus, highlighting tools, charts, calculators. So once again, this could be something that if you want to include particular things within a file, then you might want to look and see if there's a particular add-on that works for that. And once again, all you'd need to do is just hit whatever one you're wanting to look at and hit that, and that would that would add in as an add-on that you could access from any document just by hitting add-on. I'll just mention too that um, while we're working on a document today, these collaboration features work for all the other different file formats, so spreadsheets and presentations and drawings and that kind of stuff. If you need to get the document off of Drive, you can hit File, Download As, and then choose how you want to export it. Now this is my main beef with Google Drive, is that if you are converting, either putting it in from Word or taking it back out of Word, formatting, particularly if it has a bit of complexity, like some footnotes and tables or a lot of dot points, can get a bit buggy. Um, so you might take something out and get it in a Word version and it will be all over, you know, um, all over the place and take a fair bit of getting back into place. So what you could do is um, export in plain text. What I tend to do to combat this is um, if I know that I'm going to need to distribute a document through Word, I'll use Google Drive for the collaboration stage. So just get everyone collectively creating notes on Drive, so just general notes and then download as a Word doc and then do the formatting. Um, this, this is still an ongoing frustration, but it has gotten a lot better than when I was first starting to use Drive. All right, let's have a quick look through the rest of the notes that I've got here. So, wonderful, multiple people can collaborate at the same time. Version control we've gone through. It is available offline. So if I click back here, what you'd need to do now, working offline does take a little bit of forward planning, so you just need to go uh, select this offline option here and you can do the same through. So I was doing it on my iPad yesterday, is select the documents while you have an in internet collection, select, select what you're wanting to use offline before you run out of um, ability to use it. So this could be quite handy if you are working in an area where you need, um, where, where you're not going to have good connections, so if you're doing trial work or something like that, you could make sure that you download that spreadsheet before you head out to the paddock and then access that document once you're out there. <clears throat> um, you've got control over who can edit, which is great. Accessing it anywhere, this is wonderful. Once uh, Some of the cons, as I've mentioned, formatting can be a bit buggy when converting. Spreadsheets. If you are a, you know, quite an advanced Excel user, it's not going to have all the functions and bits and pieces that Excel will have. So that's something that you need to be a little bit mindful of there. And there is a slight learning curve. It looks a little bit different. You can see they've tried to keep it fairly in touch with um, what's going on uh, with Microsoft Office, but they're just in terms of working your way around it and particularly familiarising yourself with some of the options because there, there are quite a few things you can do with it. Um, that's all there. So look, here we go. Um, examples of how it could be used working on documents or spreadsheets in real time with colleagues in different geographic locations. And someone has come on and um, gone sharing files with family members who live in other places. So that's wonderful. Um, reporting on government funded projects when collaborations from partners required and also if the contract managers used it rather than track changing everything and having multiple versions would be very helpful. Thank you very much for the person who added that, that's great. So we'll just have a quick chat about what some of the comparable products and differences are. So I've um, put, a, put a link there that can show you um, some, of, some of the pricing and I uh, did have so 15 um, gigabytes, but this is always changing in terms of which cloud company allows uh, the most, so make sure you Get a re a, if you're doing your research on which one to use, choose one that's um, fairly current in terms of what the information is, but please feel free to click on that link if you'd like to have a bit of a look at a comparison for some of the other versions. But look, the, the, the cloud products that most people are familiar with are Dropbox, um, and I use Dropbox as well. Um, the diff main difference between Dropbox is that only one person can work on a document at a time. Um, you, uh, doc 
Dropbox sort of works a bit more like a library system where you check something out and then you sort of check it back in. You can have two people pulling a document out at the same time, but what Dropbox will do is it will create a duplicate copy which then needs to be integrated into the initial. And OneDrive has relatively similar um, features to Google Drive, um, but it's a bit less on the collaboration features. I'm not a huge user of OneDrive, so if anybody listening would like to add some of their comments in terms of what they've seen with Google Drive and how this might differ or be similar, then that would be absolutely wonderful. That's a quick look over Google Drive. John, do we have any questions relating to Google Drive at present and thank you everyone so far for your comments and um, additions. That's quite wonderful and I hope you're finding it easy to use. <laughs> well, thank you Prue. Yes, we do have a few questions and Prue, thank you for being brave. This is the first time we've actually done a screen sharing thing like this during one of these webinars and certainly the first time we've tried to squeeze around 100 people onto a single document. Um, and Prue, by the way, some people have actually received an error message when they tried to access that document saying, um, wow, this file is really popular. Um, some tools might be unavailable until the crowd clears. Okay. So that's interesting. Um. It's probably, yeah, I've, I've seen this done with sort of around um, 50 plus people on, but yeah, it might be an issue that if a number of people, particularly if they're all clicking on at the same time, uh, just keep trying and hope, hopefully that works out. I don't think you're going to run into too many situations where you're going to have, how many people do we have on at the moment, John? 111. Okay, well I've got 49 total viewers at the moment on this document, so I don't think you're going to run across too many um, uh, occasions in your work when uh, you, you're going to have about 50 people trying to work on a document at the same time. So um, uh, it's been a good, good test for the system, so thank you all for being guinea pigs for this. It seems to be going okay so far. Good, okay, so here are some questions. So the first one, um, so if you, there are lots of questions here, Prue, so short, sharp answers would be great. So are no the problem. apps free? Most of them are, yes. You will be able to see when you look at the add-ons or the apps, um, it will tell you what, what the cost is. Sort of if, if you're familiar with Google Play, with the App Store, whoops, I'm click Manage instead of, um, manage instead of uh, Get, but um, you should be able to see when you're looking at them. Um, it'll tell you whether there's, uh, might be the other ones, whether there's a cost or not. Oh yeah, there we go, up there, free. Um, if it costs, it will tell you up there what that cost is. Excellent, thank you. Now a couple of people commented that the link wasn't working for them, so I'm guessing that was the oversubscription problem? Potentially, yeah. I think if everybody tried to click that at one time, it um, might have, might of course, a bit of an issue. Could, uh, depending on your browser too, it might be an issue if you have an older browser. That might mm. also be cause for concern. That's usually the issue um, that I run into if people struggle to get onto a Google Doc. Yes, yeah, so, uh, some people are saying now that they're using Internet Explorer 8 and yeah, it doesn't like it. So yes, the beauty, mm. yes, so the beautiful idea with using Google uh, docs is if you use Google Chrome as your browser, that they do work really well together, mm. usually. And it, it works um, quite well on Safari and Firefox as well too, but uh, and, uh, often often I usually find if people are having a technical problem, um, changing from Internet Explorer to another browser is usually the first step and that often resolves it. Yes, that's right. Um, so here we go. So. Approve with the increasing integration between products and sharing identities, do you have any comments on maintaining personal versus professional boundaries? So, you know, to do with identity information, activities, things like that. Yeah, certainly. Um, I guess it comes down to your own individual feelings on that. I treat anything that I do in an online space, most of the stuff that I do online is uh, in a professional capacity. Um, because really, you know, it's my work, so when I'm not at work, I prefer to not be anywhere near a computer or a device if absolutely possible. So regardless of whether it is something personal that I'm posting or not, is that you do need to treat anything that you're putting online as a personal press release, even if it is just something that might be going out to friends on Facebook. So being very, very wary of the permanency of what can happen in online online spaces is quite important and, and something to be aware of and something that you could consider. Um, but, you know, I really do do most of my work that's online is in a professional capacity, so always keep that forefront in my mind whenever anything's going online. 
So, Prue, do you just have the one Gmail address then? I do, yes. Okay. Good. I've got, oh, I've got an additional one for another project that I'm on, sorry, but I don't particularly use that. Um, I try and have everything. I'm, I'm all about minimising the amount of accounts that I need to manage and keep on top of, and uh, it, it makes it easier for people to get in touch with me too if there's uh, limited points of contact. Okay, a couple of people are asking about the security of the documents, as in, you know, do Google now own your data? Um, and how is the information protected and remain confidential? Can you talk a bit about that, please? Sure. So I've got up here on the screen, because I thought this um, comment would come through, is Google's um, policies and privacy information. So look, with any cloud storage, I would be advising, and if you work for, if you're working for, um, you know, a government organisation or a, a, any private organisation as well too, they might have rules around cloud storage. Anything that is potentially sensitive, I would be keeping off cloud. I mean, in terms of security, um, a lot of these particularly well-known cloud storage providers, their servers are sort of, you know, in a number of locations and they're supposed to be earthquake proof and tsunami proof and stuff like that. So the, the worry about losing your data, they're, um, they, they're attempting to negate. In terms of file storage, though, I always, um, you know, if it's something that's uh, something that you're very worried about losing, would be storing it in a number of locations. Um, here's some more information which I can include in that Google Doc um, about what Google can and can't do and store with um, information that you put online. So um, I would suggest that we probably won't go through that in the interest of time today, but that's the resource there and I'll cut and paste that and put that into that Enabling Change webinar now so people can go and visit that and um, review all those bits and pieces as they see fit a bit later. Are you there, John? Yes, sorry, I was letting you finish doing your cutting and pasting because I know I, I struggled. Oh, sorry, I, I, I had a bit of a crackle through the line and thought that maybe the audio had done something a bit funny. Uh, um, just quickly, if, if someone has a Google Earth, if, if they use Google Earth, does that mean they've got a Google account already? Um, most probably. I'd have to double check on that. But if you are using so Google Mapping or any of those tools, it is the same one account. So I, I would be very inclined to say yes, but I'm not 100% sure on that. I can have a look at that, I'll take a note and um, see if that integrates and uh, put that in the notes following the webinar. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and some okay. people are asking, what happens when you're not online? How can you access the document? Um, so if you're not online, all you'd need to do beforehand, um, as I mentioned before, it, it, unfortunately this takes a little bit more preparation is that you need to think, right, I'm going to be in an area where I don't have connectivity or I'm going to be on a flight and um, you know, we'll obviously not be able to get internet access. So you'd need to go into your drive account beforehand and um, make sure that the, um, and sync a document that was available offline. So any of your other documents you should be able to um, from within the document. Oops, I've already got that one open, sorry. Um, I think I've got mine set up or file, offline. No, I've got. I, I have mine set up for documents to automatically sync offline. So I'll have to find out how I initially set that up, and I can include that in the notes as well too. So how sure. to set no, up offline. No, yeah, no, no. Certainly, um, when I'm using my iPad and I'm accessing my Google Drive, it gives me the little option next to the name of the file whether I would like to be able to access that offline. So it then kind of stores it on the iPad for me. Yeah, yep, yeah, excellent. No, that's good. Um, yeah, no, I set mine up a while ago. Oh, hang on, have I put the... No, I haven't put a link there. Um, yeah, I set it up a while ago so that it should automatically be available offline because I often work in areas with limited connectivity. So I'll have to refresh my memory. Often you set these things up once and then forget how you've done it. So I know that I've got a resource for that somewhere, so I'll include that in that document for those that are interested following the webinar. Sure, and I'm assuming that if you then work on the document offline, when you next come back online, it syncs it all, doesn't it? Exactly, yep. Yeah, great, good, thank you. There we go. Okay, so I think we've done well in answering a bunch of questions there. So, Prue, why don't you move on to the next section?
not a problem. Okay, so we're going to move into um, where am I? Google Plus. So despite not being a particularly widely known social media platform, it's probably the closest thing you'll get right now to a one size fits all social media. And if you haven't used G Plus before, but you do have a Gmail or a Google account, you might have seen your name up in the top here with a plus sign next to it. If you click this and then um, if you haven't done it before, you'll need to complete a few additional steps, but that's all you need to do to sign up to G Plus. No more usernames and passwords. So this is my home page. I don't really spend any time on the home page at, at all. It's just a feed of people that I follow and anything that might be trending on G Plus at the present time. This home button up here in the left hand corner gives you the G Plus menu and an overview of all, all the things that it can do. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I'm going to take you straight to communities first because this is how I use G Plus most frequently and it's where I think most benefit can be gained at present. So if I go into this, here you can see that I moderate one community and I'm a member of a handful of others. Um, so G Plus is a very tech heavy social media. So you're, if you're interested in staying current with all the happenings in a particular technological area, these communities have some very switched on individuals sharing some pretty cutting edge stuff. Um, I use a lot of the tech communities that you can see here for troubleshooting and help. Um, usually you get really good quality replies in a short period of time. So for example, um, a couple of months back I created a Google form and I wanted to know if there was a way that those who fill out the form could keep a copy of what they filled in so that they could revisit the goals that they'd indicated further down the track. Um, I had a number of really good responses from around the world and people um, helped me step through what was going to be a fairly tech heavy procedure. So basically the idea behind a community is an online forum around a particular theme of interest it's housed within G+. If you wanted to search for community, and there's communities for absolutely everything. Um, a friend of mine works in elephant conservation of all things, and he was asking me the other day if he could pilfer some of my contacts to try and send out some information regarding an event. And I said, I don't think my contacts are going to be the best people to help you out in terms of elephant conservation. But uh, what I do have is um, this, have, have, you, have you ever used G Plus before? And he said, no, I hadn't. So we came in and we just searched for elephants and he was able to come up with five communities who are there specifically looking for elephants, uh, elephant-related information and conservation activities. We were able to tap into people that way. So you could search for communities for absolutely anything there or you could create a community yourself here. And if you create a community, you have options of public or private. So if it's public community, Anybody can find it and join it. If it's private, you've got two options. You can either have people can search for it and then ask to join, and a moderator will need to approve them joining, or um, <coughs> excuse me, um, <coughs> or it can just be private and people need to be invited only. Um, so that means that if you wanted something that was perhaps a little bit more locked down and a bit more selective, then you would go with that. I'm going to take you into the community that I moderate now as an example, and that's the second option. It's a private community, and <coughs> excuse me, it's a private community, and but people can search for it up here. So if you would like to join, you're more than welcome to search for digital ready grain growers, and then ask to join. I won't be able to accept those requests until after the webinar, though, so I apologise. Um, so this is Digital Ready Grain Growers. This community is part of a GRDC funded national pilot project led by O'Callaghan's Rural Management and it involves partners across Australia. The objective of this pilot project was to create and deliver a national series of workshops assisting grain producers to maximise benefit from smartphones and tablets, use social media as an information gathering tool <coughs> and assess and adopt apps and decision support tools for use on farm. We didn't want to put together a printed manual because that kind of stuff dates incredibly quickly and um, you know, everything changes and gets, updates, up, gets updated and looks quite different. So we decided that we'd provide an online learning network for workshop participants so they could follow up on anything they were unsure of after the workshop. They could also tap into any other emerging resources that I would put out and they can share key learnings with one another. 
on a slightly selfish note, this is also fantastic for me because it's sort of a, uh, a, a searchable archive for me of uh, content that I come across that I think is really relevant to my work that I can search for going forward. Uh, we decided to go with a G plus community over a Facebook group because um, our evidence suggested that a number of workshop participants were a bit anti-Facebook and it's predominantly due to mainstream perceptions and often due to having teenagers in the house. <coughs> Others felt that their Facebook accounts were purely for personal reasons that didn't want to mix business with pleasure, so to speak. Um, the search algorithm for Facebook isn't great and sometimes finding what you're looking for, even if you're typing it incorrectly, can prove a bit problematic. And um, Facebook, particularly for groups, is moving towards a paid system, whereas G plus posts can reach all community members without incurring a cost. <clears throat> so uh, this gives you a quick snapshot. We're up to 149 members at the moment. <coughs> Um, and as you can see, we've got a bit of information here about the community. This is where you put your guidelines in, uh, alerting people to what is and isn't appropriate to be shared within the community. Um, so thinking about guidelines before you set up a community is quite useful. Down the left-hand side here, what you can see is a number of categories. And I have decided, or the, the moderators decide on what these categories are. You can have as many as you would like and you name them according to what you think is useful. So here we've put in information for helping Android and Apple users get set up, apps, cloud documents. So basically all the categories relate to workshop content. There's one on workshop resources and, um, and events as well too. So for example, if we click on apps and go into that, here you can see that a number of people have, including myself, have left resources that relate to apps for grain producers. So you can see here that we had someone comment, um, Jeffrey the farmer, I think he's in New South Wales, came on the other day and was looking for some, some tips on paddock records and livestock management apps. And so we had a number of farmers who participated in workshops from around Australia have popped on and given him a bit of a perspective. You can see Frank here has um, loaded one of John's webinars from previously on navigating the app development minefield. So that's fantastic. Um, so what you can do is you can post to G+, you can create your own post which is fairly easy. All you need to do is type in what you're interested, add a photo, a link, a video or an event and then select the category that that relates to and then you would share that. You can also comment on other people's posts by just typing in the comment below. And what G+, also has is this plus one button which is <coughs> equivalent to a Facebook like, essentially. Um, but uh, the uh, where I can see, and it's not quite happening yet, you can come across it occasionally, but um, with the plus one is what this will do. Say, for example, um, Frank, uh, if I'm searching for something online, I'm doing a Google search, and I get my standard Google search come up with my number of results, is that it might say that Jeffrey and Frank have plus one one of those search items and if I think that Jeffrey and Frank are particularly versed in what I'm searching for, I might choose that option over anything else in those search results as a consequence of their endorsement. So it's basically looking at that and going, okay, who around me is, you know, plus one-ing material and how might that influence my searching habits going forward. Um, in terms of editing, Fairly, uh, the editing option is here, and that gives you the ability to move these around, delete them, add categories should you wish, update your information, add some links, change your privacy settings. You've also got the ability with your members have a bit of an overview of who's there. So there's some for approval. So I'll add these three in now. And you've also got the ability to invite people should you wish. Um, and you have the ability with people is to remove, ban or promote from a member to a moderator. So if you want to have a couple of people who are on that community um, 
as moderators to help oversee it, then that's absolutely fantastic. So you've got a bit of control over what you can do there. Moving on to some of the other features that um, are in G+, and just before I leave this community, if anybody's particularly interested, this res uh, a resource here by Martin Shervington is, a, I think it's about a 16-minute Google Plus overview video, which um, drills into some of, the, some of the areas that I don't use as regularly in my work. So if anyone's particularly interested, Martin Shervington is a bit of a, a G Plus guru and um, is you know, it has a number of good resources that will help you drill into specific areas of G+, if you see something that you think is of particular interest to you. But um, we'll go back here. So you have a profile, as you would with most of your standard social media. So there we go. That's a photo from the Keith Headed Demolition Derby in South Australia. It's a fantastic event. If you've never been, get along. That's a bit of an overview of what I've been doing. Um, what you've got as well, too, um, which is what I quite like about G plus is circles. So you have the ability here, what you can see is you can create a number of circles, so friends, family, acquaintances, following, that's a group of my colleagues, and here's agriculture. So you can create circles depending on the groups of people that you work with. Um, so a circle is your way of arbitrarily grouping together people that you want to um, send content out to. So what I might do is if I want to go back home and I wanted to share a link, perhaps I found a link that was particularly relevant to um, apps, that I would add that link, add in the comment, and then you would select, you can choose a particular circle, so you could choose, uh, I might choose my work colleagues or agriculture, or I could sh share that directly to that community or any other communities that I'm a member of, or I could just share it to one individual person. So this is a really neat feature of G+, is that you have total control over who you send content to. So you have the ability to send that directly to whoever you would like. So say, for example, you had a work-related resource, you could send it to a work circle. If you had a photo from the family reunion on the weekend, you could send that out to the family circle. If you had you know, a, a funny picture that you wanted to send to your friends, you'd send it to a friend circle. If you had a particular community, you might want to send minutes for a community group or something like that, you could put those people in that circle. So it's a really, really good way of being able to easily select who you want to send content to and only those people. Um, events is basically a, it's a fairly similar to the Facebook function. You have the ability to schedule an event, whether that be, so here's some events that I've held. Um, so it could be a physical event or an online event. You have the ability to do that. Um, pages, it's, now this is something that I don't, well, I don't use, but what you could use with pages is for your business settings. So this is obviously from a very, very long time ago. Um, but with pages, what you would do is this would link in with Google Maps, particularly if you have a, a physical business presence. This is where people could leave you Google reviews, and if people were to search on a Google Map for a particular business, this is where you'd show up. So this is uh, sort of similar to a, you'd use a community to center around a theme of interest, a page to promote a particular business, and circles to determine who you wanted to send out content to. Hangouts is um, basically Google's answer to Skype. So what you can do with the Hangout is, and you can see here, there's a chat function as well too, so you can start a video Hangout, choose who you would like to, so I can chat and say, look, are you online, are you ready to hang out? The, um, the main difference, and we can go back to the notes here now, thank you to the person who cut and pasted the online content there, that's wonderful. Um, so Google Hangouts here, Skype versus Hangouts. Skype allows 10 people on a call at once for free, which is a, a new change. Only recently it was just one-to-one, -one, whereas Google Hangouts allows 15. Um, Hangouts also integrates with Google Drive, so you can all be working on a document in your virtual meeting. So for example, I was giving a lecture at Longer Long Agricultural College late last year, and there were a number of people who were quite, uh, students who were quite excited about the ability they had to um, all be sitting in different locations working on a document and discussing at the same time. 
So once again, whether you use Hangouts or Skype depends on what you're familiar with and whether or not the people that you're going to need to be communicating with are using this. So just to recap on those notes there, pros of Google Plus, it's great for tech-based info. I think Google Hangouts is quite a good product. Um, you have the ability to use Hangouts on Air as well too, which is a webinar style tool and which is free. So um, if you're looking at webinar style tools, Hangouts on Air could be something that you want to use. Um, and it does stream directly live to YouTube as well too, so people who aren't on G Plus might be able to access it. Um, the thing with Hangouts, I, once you're using the Hangout, I find that the quality is a bit better than Skype, but in terms of actually getting into the Hangout and planning it, is it, it tends to sort of change a little bit in terms of how you get in, so it's not an incredibly intuitive process. The circles are good in terms of your ability to choose who sees what, it's easily searchable. It's an option for um, you know, being able to collaborate with people who might not want to go near Facebook. And you've got that ability to curate content and have that all there in a searchable archive. The major con is that it's not particularly well used. It's not a very popular social media platform. So if you're looking at pushing out information and getting you know, it to lots and lots of people, G plus might not be what you're wanting to do. But if you're wanting to have a collaborative group that you have a level of control over who's in there, <coughs> excuse me, then you um, <coughs> then you might want to steer clear of G plus. Getting your head around the difference between circles, pages, communities, all that kind of stuff, that takes a little bit of getting used to and um, you know, there's there's a lot there. It's a very flexible system that can do a lot of things. So understanding what you're trying to get out of it and which part of that menu is the best for meeting your needs can take a little bit of time to work out what you're wanting to do. So some examples of how it could be used. Have a private community where you centre it around a particular theme. You can get tech support. Um, just, you know, I'll, if I have a bit of time, up my sleeve, we'll jump on some of those communities and just have a little bit of an overview of what's happening. Um, other social media platforms, so as we mentioned, here's, here's a little bit of a, a, a visual of why you, you know, what the main social media platforms are and why you might use one over the other or use them all to complement. There's all a level of integration between all of the social media platforms now, so it would really be a matter of sitting down and work, working out who are you trying to communicate, where are they and what are their preferences and choosing the appropriate social media for that. And um, you know, we're sort of at the point where often you need to be across a couple of different social media platforms in order to try and reach everyone that you're trying to communicate with, but that might not necessarily always be possible. Um, we'll go to questions now, John, because we're rapidly running out of time. Okay, here we go, folks. So we do have a few questions here. So, um, Prue, how do you know when someone has responded to a query you, that you put into a G Plus community? Not a problem. You just enable notifications, and that will pop up. So as you can see, if I go back to the community here, that's not it, sorry. Go back one, and I'll just need to hide that webinar one. If we go back there, you can see this little bell there with a, has a number one next to it. Mm. That means that there's yep, one notification sorry. pending there. And um, if you enable notifications on your mobile phone as well too, you'll get a message that will pop up that will say, uh, so-and-so has posted in this community or you have a new follower or something like that. Mm, sure. Um, a few people have asked whether there may be firewall issues with using some of these products, especially Hangouts. Yeah, definitely, and that's that's a key issue that we've run into time and time again with Hangouts is that if you, yes, firewalls are a big issue and it's the same with Skype as well too, so that's something that you need to be aware of what your system will and won't allow. Um, often I'll try and potentially use, if I, if I, you know, I'll always have with Skype, Hangouts, any of this stuff will all always have a backup plan up my sleeve ready to go. Because sometimes the teleconference is still best. Um, so it would be a matter of testing your system beforehand and making sure that it allows it and understanding that if people are having problems getting on, then it might not be the product itself that's a firewall issue. So that's definitely something you need to be aware of. And John, you and I have spoken about that previously. That's something <laughs> we've come up against. That's true. <clears throat> okay. Thanks, Prue. Um, 
Uh, and just a comment from one of the listeners today saying that kids use OOVU, so that's O-O-V-O-O, -O -O, uh, which is another option for Google Hangouts. It allows up to 12 people at a time. Um, and I'm aware there's 101 products like that. So yes, thanks for sharing that one with us. Um, through, someone's asking, um, do you find this um, use of uh, uh, predominantly Google Plus, I guess, as an effective means of engaging with growers? So you know, can facilitating the social media side of our agricultural extension work and our facilitation roles, can it take over from the usual way that we do things of running field days and workshops? Like, so two parts, is it effective and is it too time consuming? Okay, look, uh, this uh, community has really only been sort of running since uh, March this year, so and, and we've just uh, run the last workshop yesterday, so we will be sitting down and doing a comprehensive evaluation. That said, we are sort of starting to get a number of people that are coming and asking questions or coming back and saying, thank you for showing us that. I've set up this as a consequence to do this, and um, that will be wonderful. So that's some good feedback. Um, I do need to drill down and see how many people are using these resources, but seeing things like plus oneing is knowing that it's getting through there. It's not that time intensive in terms of, you know, as you've seen, they're, they're a fairly simple product to use. And I mean, often I'm coming across a lot of this information in my day-to-day -day dealings. So if I come across something and I go, I think growers would benefit from this, then I'll immediately put that on the G Plus community and it only takes a little bit of time. So it's basically just an extension of me looking for stuff that helps me in my work and then pushing it out um, to people who I also think might benefit from it. Um, what, was the, what was the third part in there? Uh, it was the time. Oh, does it does it comp, does it comp, uh, does it take detract from? Look, I you know I would hope that we're never detracting from you know that actual face to face interaction with growers. But that said, you know there's a, an abundance of workshops that are available on the market, and you know everybody's getting more and more time poor. So I'm hoping that all these products are perhaps a complement that instead of taking a whole day off with a lot of travel for both the facilitators of workshops and the participants that this could be something that would complement. So instead of perhaps running a you know, series of face-to-face -face events, you could run one face-to-face -face event and then have a number of follow-on digital products. Once again, it depends on what you're trying to get out there because face-to-face -face will always still be important for some, some bits and pieces. So it's, um, you know, I, I think these tools are complements and hopefully time-saving. Um, certainly not going to replace anything, not now anyway. Yeah, good. Thanks, Fred. Just one final question. One of our observant uh, listeners today noticed on your screen that you had super metrics that you were using mm -hmm. that. It was in one of your drop-down menus. Can you tell us yes. briefly about that and how useful it is? Sure. That was an add-on. Um, what you would do with super metrics is just basically a bit of an overview of if I can get it working, is you would plug in some of your social media channels and it will allow you to incorporate a little bit of a um, overview of what you're looking for. So here you go, you'd be able to add in and go to your Facebook or your Twitter account, log into a data source that you're looking for and then it would give you those analytics and you'd be able to incorporate that into your document. Brilliant. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so, so at this stage, Prue, thank you so much for sharing your presentation with us today and, and it's been really generous of you to share your experiences. So thank you very much for the time that you've given us today. Not a problem, my pleasure, and apologies for the frog in my throat. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so I've just got a question for the audience now. So you've heard about Google+. Plus. So after these webinars, I like to engage with the audience so that you can ask further questions. So my question for you is, well, would you prefer to continue using the LinkedIn platform or do you think that maybe I should be creating a Google Plus platform that we can use? So if you yeah, can just give a vote there. I mean, like Historically, I actually used WordPress, um, but it was very difficult for people to leave comments because you have to log in and yeah, do lots of secret squirrel stuff. So I can see most people have now voted. Well, actually, <laughs> just over half the people have voted. Um, but I'll just close it off now because uh, time is pressing. And I'll just share the result. Oh, look at that. So wouldn't you believe it? OK, so three quarters of the people are saying they'd like to see a Google Plus platform. 
So thanks for that, folks. So I will do some work on that and uh, see what we can come up with. So just before everyone runs away, if I can just share this with you. So after the webinar, I will encourage you to use the uh, current LinkedIn page uh, where you can see the recording of today's webinar uh, and you can pop over there to join the discussion. Today's webinar has been brought to you by a partnership between the Queensland Government, whom I have the pleasure of working, APEN, the Professional Organisation for Extension, and Citrix GoToWebinar. Uh, in case you're not aware of APEN, the Australasia Pacific Extension Network, uh, it, so if your work involves facilitating change in industries, communities, and the way we manage our natural resources, then you might like to find out, out a bit more about APEN. And there's a number of ways you can do that. There's a LinkedIn group, there's Twitter, and there's Facebook. So folks, as always, we use SurveyMonkey to follow up um, our webinars, and the monkeys will be waiting to hear your responses. Um, so once you've completed the post-event survey, I've actually asked the monkeys to swing you over to our user voice site, which you can see here, where you can nominate and vote on future topics. So you'll see that the highest ranked one at the moment is planning effective extension. And I'm pleased to say that I've now found a speaker for that topic. And I'll send you the details that uh, closer to the time. So folks, thanks uh, for joining us today. It's been great to have you along. Thanks for interacting and asking so many really good questions. And I look forward to seeing your comments and ideas over at the LinkedIn group until I can create a Google Plus one for you. So thanks again to Prue uh, and wishing everyone all the very best until we meet again. Peru for now.